In this demonstration, we're going to bill outpatient charges on UB4 form. As previously noted, the UB4 form is billed for inpatient outpatient charges if it was rendered, if the services was rendered at an inpatient facility, a clinic or skilled nursing facility, any facility that is classified as inpatient, then it would be billed on a UB4 form. Billing out patient charges on a UB4 form is very unique because the patient doesn't have to necessarily be in the hospital for three and four days for this to be a qualification. In Module 7 and also the appendix section, you have a copy of the instruction form for outpatient charges. Please retrieve it and follow along with me. You can also use this for a guide for your exercises and assignments and your quizzes. And when you start to work uh, for yourself or for an employer, you can use it as a guide. Everything that we do in medical billing is about knowing where to go to get your resources to get the correct information. You do not necessarily have to memorize everything from the beginning because you won't be able to. Most of your experience is going to come when you're actually billing and, um, and calling their insurance companies and asking questions and things of that sort. Once you get your first client, whether it be a skilled nursing facility or hospital where you have to bill inpatient or podiatry where you might bill outpatient, you want to perfect that skill first. If you just get clients from different other specialties, that's going to be awesome as well. But you want to really put emphasis on what you learned first in terms of what kind of clients you get. So if you get, you know, a dermatologist, learn everything there is to know about dermatology billing so that you can do specific marketing to dermatologists and then before you know it you'll be rolling really good and dermatology billing then you say okay well let me get into dental let me you know practice more of my dental billing and get some of those clients in um, so wherever it comes first that's what you want to specialize and okay so let's start form locator one also known as field located in fls and field locator one you're going to put the billing provider name, street address, city, state, telephone, fax, and country code. What's mandatory is what I've put, the name, the address, zip code, and the state, the city. If the pay to address, where they want their checks to go to, or their EFT banking address is different than one, then you can put it here such the way that I did. Otherwise, you can leave it blank. In field located 3A and B, you have the 3A for the patient account number, and 3B for the medical record number. In most cases, your provider may just have a medical record number to identify his patient internally, so you can put that in 3A and leave 3B blank because 3B is not mandatory, but 3A is. Let's go over to Form Locator 4. Remember the type of bill that you learned in your previous lessons? Well, here we have 131. One for hospital, three for outpatient, and one for admit to discharge. Remember, admit to discharge means I'm not billing any more claims for this member for these data services. Form locator five, federal tax ID number must be the number that corresponds for the facility location. Do not put the rendering provider's tax ID here. It should be only for the billing of facility. Form located six, the statement from and through dates of service covered on this claim only, which would be 11-3-19 to 11-4. We do not use field locator seven. Field locator 8A, to the left of your UB4 form. 8A, if the patient ID is different, the patient ID number that the insurance company gives is different than the subscriber, then you can put the ID number here. When you bill ele electronically, it's just going to ask you for the patient's ID and the subscriber ID separately. And it will, some, some systems say, if it's a checkbox, it'll be a checkbox, will drop down menu and say, is the subscriber the same as the patient? And you can simply click yes. It depends on who you want to choose for your billing system. And in 8B, patient's name 
and you would enter it last, first, and middle initial in that format. It is a required field. And then you have field locator nine, patient address. Field locator 10 is the birth date. And notice that for field locator 10, we are billing in the format of two digits for the month, two digits for the day, four digits for the year. In field locator 11, we have the sex. I have male for mine. And then we have the admission area. That admission area is one of those field locators that I said we need to give special attention to. In fact, there is one, two, three, four, five in that section. The admission date is in the format of two digits for the month, two digits for the day, and two digits for the year. So I have 11, 3, 19. The admission hour, I have 08, which corresponds to 8 a.m. That is the time the patient was admitted or arrived. Okay. Because if they was not admitted, that would be the arrival time. Form locator 14 is the type of visit. And for this claim example, I chose three for elective. Field locator 15 is the point of origin. What is the source of emission? That is what we learned in the previous demonstration, the source of emission. And I chose three. And you're going to find all of these codes in your UB4 manual that you have to subscribe to the NUBC to uh, get your source of codes and the updated condition codes and all of that. Form located 16 is the discharge hour. Okay. And I chose 12 o'clock, which in this example is 12 noon. And then we have field locator 17, the discharge status, which is a required field. It is a two digit code. In this example, I use 01, which is discharge to home or self care. Then we have form locator 18 through 28. Remember we learned about condition codes? If you had condition codes, this is where you could list them here. In 29, if there was an accident, you would put the state here. And notice it says situational because it may not or may not be required. Of course, if it's not an accident, we're not going to put anything there, which I didn't. Field locator 30 is reserved for NUBC, so we don't use. And then there's our occurrence codes that we learned about previously. If you have an occurrence code, like the last menstrual cycle for a woman, you will put the code in the dates. That is field 31 through 34. And then 35 and 36, if you have an occurrence span through where there's a date from and through a more than one data service in there, you would put it here. We do not use form, form locator 37. Form locator 38, the responsible party's name and address. So let's just say, for example, we had a different person here. Then if it was the subscriber was different than, than John Doe, we could put the subscriber's information here. And just like the example, it's, it's the same. But if, say, Mary Doe, his wife, was the owner of the policy, we would put Mary Doe and her information there too. Field 
Dental locator 39 through 41. This is where you want to put your value codes that you learned about previously. In my example, I used A1 for deductible. The patient has a deductible of $650. And I'm reporting that to the insurance company that she has that deductible. Now, this section 42 through 48 is what I like to call the money line. And this is where you're gonna put your charges, your units, your dates of services. So we have, and these are real revenue codes. These are real procedure codes. So revenue code three tenths for laboratory. They had lab charges. And they had the procedure code 88173. Remember, and that is um, for the lab, the pathology lab work they had done. Remember when you have revenue codes, you have to have a HCPCS code or CPT code that goes with it. The service date was 11-3 for one unit for $100. Then we have a second line item. 0402 for the ultrasound. There's that HCPCS or CPT code that goes with it. The date of service was November 4th. One unit and the charge was $100. Then I have my third line. Revenue code 360, ORs for operating room services. I have the procedure code. And then I have that LT there. So in this example, we have a modifier. So when you have a modifier on an inpatient claim, you just put it right next to the procedure code. When you're billing on paper, when you're billing on your electronic system, your billing system or validity, then you will see a separate box for that. Okay? But when you're billing on paper, this is how it looks. And then your data service, your units, and your charges. So follow me down from 47 straight down to the end of the column where it says totals. That's where you bring down your $300. And 48, sometimes when you're doing inpatient charges, people put the non-covered charges here for their internal records. The payer is not gonna do anything with them. But it may be that their usual customary rate, what they would normally charge, is gonna be more than what the contract is with the insurance company. And because that's the case, they may wanna see the difference for their own notes. It can be several reasons why they wanna indicate it there. But if you ever see that, don't ever calculate it into here and report it. It's gonna be ignored. So you don't do any math with it. It's just there for their internal purposes. Okay? And then we do not use form locator 49. 50. Form locator 50 is the payer identification. Now, notice we have 50A, B, and C because you can have more than one insurance company. If you were billing a Medicare claim, Medicare claim, then on 50A, if it's Medicare, you would write Medicare here. You would really have to write it out, Medicare here. That's how Medicare wants their claims. Um, in this example, we have ABC Healthcare, and if there was a secondary insurance, you would put it here, and if it was a third insurance, you would put it there. You're likely not to find anyone with four and five insurance. It's normally just one, two, or three or one of the other, one or one, two, and three. 51 health plan ID. So this is situational. If the health plan have 
assign a plan ID, you can list it here. If not, you just ignore it. Form Locator 52 is the release of information. It's asking you, did you get permission from the patient to bill charges to their insurance company? And if that is the case, you will put yes. 53 is assignment of benefits. If your provider accepts Medicaid or Medicare assignments, you will put Y for yes. 54, it's only required if it applies. Required when indicated payer has paid amount to a provider if there's prior payments. Fifty-five is the amount due. Now, of course, if there's prior payments, then you want to subtract it from the amount due. So you're going to post a credit. So you only want to invoice the insurance company for the balance. Fifty-six is the MPI number. It's the MPI number for the billing provider. It is required. Fifty-seven is right below that. We do not use this field unless, for some reason, a provider doesn't have an MPI number. They have a specially assigned number um, that was government issued for some reason other than the requirements of having an MPI number. That is very rare that we would have anything else other than the MPI number in this section. 58 is the insurance name. So there we see John Doe again. And 59, the relationship, it's his self. If it was a subscriber or son, you would enter the patient relationship code there, which you would get from your UB4 manual. 50 locator 60, the insurer's unique ID number. That is where you will put the insurance identification number from the insurance company that's on their card. And then field locator 61 is the insurance group name. That is the every company and employer when they sign up for insurance for their for their employees, the insurance company is going to give them a group name. And they'll give them a group number. And you can probably pull out your own card if you have one from an employer and you'll see on the front or back of it the group name and the group number. That's what that is. And it's situational because it's optional, but I would encourage you to list it. The more information you can list about the policy um, holder and where the insurance come from is, is good for your claims. 63. Treatment authorization code. So if the service required an authorization, you would get a referral or authorization electronically, paper or fax or mail from your uh, the insurer's plan, then you would put it here. The document control number, which is field locator 64, is also referred to as an internal control number. This is what's issued by the insurance company. It is not a mandatory field. And then you have the employer name, JKL Cable. And it's okay if you um, leave it off. It's not going to, you know, deny the claim. Down here towards the bottom, and I'll zoom in a little bit, we have 66, Diagnosis Code. 
So this is where you're going to put your ICD-10 code. So we have H40.89. If there's more than one, you can put it in these fields where you see these alphabets. 66, where it has A through, through O. We do not use 68. And then 69, we have the emitting diagnosis code, which in this example is the same. It can be different, so don't be alarmed. In fact, in some of your exercises, you may see that it's different. And in box 70, the patient reason for the visit code is optional. You do not have to use that. 71. And 72 is situational. 71 is PPS code. This is something that the insurance companies used to require providers use, the prospective payment system code. I'm not aware of anyone that still uses it, but they still have it on UB441. And we do not use 73. 74 is the other procedure codes, the principal procedure codes, and the date. That's like the main procedure code that we talked about in the previous demonstration. We do not use 75. And in 76, over here to the right, this is the attending doctor's information. This is the doctor who actually physically rendered the service took the blood pressure, you know, fixed a broken ankle, whatever the case may be. That doctor can be different than the billing doctor. So Dr. Jones in this example works for ABC Hospital. He's the attending or sometimes this word says rendering. Okay, it'll say attending or rendering provider. Well, the insurance company needs to know who that is. So you will put his NPI and his taxonomy code, okay? And then that qualified there is G2, all right? And you will find this information, the qualified that goes with um, Box 76 in your NUBC manual. Also, you will see this in some of your cheat sheets that we have in the appendix, how to get your qualifier for your taxonomy code. And then we have the doctor's last name and first name. Also, if there's an operating physician in box 77, you will put the operating physician's name and taxonomy code, an MPI number. Other in box 78, if there's more than one physician that was attending, and this happens a lot in emergency claims, you know, you can have three and four doctors for one patient. This is very frequent in inpatient billing. You would list it here. The remarks, we don't use that much, but if you ever um, work for a durable medical equipment company, which we call DME, they use those remarks a lot to say, you know, I gave silver crutches instead of gold crutches because I was out of stock with silver crutches or whatever the note may be, but it's normally very short um, wording and it's pertaining to something going on with the claim. But we don't put notes in here like, please call me when the claim pays or please don't deny my claim because you denied it four times. We don't put things like that. When you learn about durable medical equipment billing, you will know how to use box 80 and it's an optional field. It's situational based on the circumstances. So don't put any other notes in here unless you're billing durable medical equipment claims and then you can see what goes in that field. In field locator 81, A, B, C, and D, that's where you will put the taxonomy code in the qualifier there in box 81. And that concludes our UB4 instructions for outpatient charges. 
that goes on a UB4 form because the services were rendered at a hospital, an inpatient facility. In your exercises and assignments, you will see ER charges and you will see inpatient when patients are stayed for three and four days. So you can see the difference in billing for inpatient charges when they're actually admitted and stay for a long time versus outpatient lab charges and ultrasound charges like we did here. So this way you can get a lot of practice. Feel free to email us. You will have a lot of questions about UB4 form more than you would um, CMS 1500. It's very expected and we are waiting for it. So please don't be shy. Ask seven or eight times. If you have to email us a mistake that you did on your uh, UB4 exercise, just upload it, email it, and we will get it corrected. We're here for you to succeed. So do not feel shy about asking your question, even if it's the same question 50 times. We want you to get it right. We want you to be successful in your jobs and in your business. In order to do that, you have to ask what you don't know. Please proceed to your next lesson.